We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for questions to get to us is through the website. That way nothing gets lost. It goes in my inbox and it's nice and tracked and sorted. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Well, tonight's question comes from the Tabletop Bellhop blog. Ashley Rabum writes, I just started listening and I'm going through the back catalog and I'm loving it. I do have a question, though. It's kind of two questions, but I think they're related. What are some older slash out of print games that you would recommend tracking down? And two, are there any games with older editions in which the older edition is worth holding on to, tracking down, or better than the more recent edition? Well, thanks so much for listening, Ashley. Uh, it's cool that you're going back to the backlog, though I do apologize for our audio quality and stiltedness during some of our earlier episodes. There is some great content back there, though. Yeah, we do keep trying to improve our quality in various ways, and the structure of those early shows is so very different as well. But there is some good content in those early Ask the Bellhop segments if you can suffer through the freshman episodes. Yeah, there's some stuff I wish we hadn't answered back then, like best two-player co-ops. We, like, we could do so much better now. It'd probably be the same list of games. we just do a better job. So we're going to start off with the first part of Ashley's question, where they're looking for older out-of-print games that we recommend seeking out and tracking down. Order or out-of-print or both and or. Uh, the second part, though, about games that um, are better, where the old versions are better, we'll get back to later, because i got to think about that one for a bit, because I know there are some out there. i got a couple in mind, but I may be able to come up with some more. Maybe the chat room can help me out with that. Well, luckily, the uh, as we as we say here, we're not about the new hotness, so the yeah. bellhop really is the one to answer these questions about some older games that uh, you know still hold their own on the table. Yeah, because you know what? Despite the fact there are a crazy number of new games releasing every year, um, I mean, we knew the numbers from two years ago. I don't know the numbers this year. From what I hear, it's actually down, but it's still like over 5,000 games. It's it's ridiculous. And all of the gaming media out there, whether it's podcasts, blogs, uh, video on demand, whatever, YouTube, everyone seems to be dedicated to the latest and greatest. Whatever the, the hot Kickstarter is right now or the games that are coming out in S in 2021. Long-time listeners of the show probably know, and as Sean just alluded to, we're, we've never really been all about the new hotness. Now and then, we get lucky. We've got something like Medium we're going to be talking about later. That's, that's pretty cutting edge for us, right? Now and then, it happens. But you know what? I, I don't care about the new hotness myself. I, I don't need to have a, the brand new game right now. What I am a big proponent of is playing good games. Any good game. Good games don't have a date stamp on them. Well, I can't deny it. there are some great games coming out, and I fully admit there'll probably be some amazing games released this year and next year and the year after. Some truly great games stay great forever. Yeah, I was actually a bit frustrated on Twitter yesterday. Big shock. As I saw someone <laughs> asking about asking people for inspiration by naming what new hot games they were playing. And I just wanted to shout, what about the thousands of other games that come out every year that may be fantastic, except everyone ran past them because the next day something newer and hotter came out. Yeah, there, there was a time when, when content creators like me, like people, Tom Vassell remembers this time period. He's been at this way longer than we have, where you could theoretically play all the games. And he's saying not all, like, like certain ones, like don't step on it, you can skip those. But like all of the potentially good hobby games, there was a time period. That's impossible now. You are going to overlook something. I think now I need to do a Pepperidge Farm Remembers meme about Tom Vassell, though. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The main problem with older games, as Ashley notes, though, is that they, too, tend to go out of print, which does drive some of this drive for the new hotness, right? Heck, some of the new games go out of print. Now, Tom Vassell, again, we're going to bring him back up. I guess we're talking about Tom a lot tonight. You know who Tom Vassell is, I hope. He's probably the biggest name in board game media. He has uh, a lot. And he, he coined it himself. I have my own law. He's got his law. And his law is any game that is good will not remain out of print and will eventually be available. So the question is, if it's out of print, is it worth finding? Yeah. And we'll get to some hints on that. Now, for Palm Vassal's law, he has been proven to be right. Like, at first when I heard him say this, I'm like, no, because 
you know what? Agiza is one of my favorite games. If I had done this episode that we're doing right now, I would have been talking all about Agizia, the top game on my list. Oh, their game, you got to get it. It's amazing. Track it down. Pay 80 bucks for it. It's worth it. You might even want to pay more. And of course, Dark Tower, the grail game of almost every hobby gamer, everyone who grew up in the 80s, anyone who's seen the thing in real life, right? As of right now, Agizia was just reprinted at the end of 2019 by Stronghold, Stronghold Games, put it out. And you know what? Dark Tower is coming out this year. So Vassal's Law in effect right there, like two of the biggest games for me that, that I never thought we'd see again. And here they are. But it's not universal. There are definitely games out there that will never be reprinted. Some of them, great. As for games, we're going to mention below, it's going to be a mix. Once we get into a game recommendations, they're all going to be old. Some will still be in print, but some will be sadly no longer available. After all, every law has its exceptions that prove it. Yeah, and that is what Tom used to say every time someone said, Bark, Dark Tower! And he's like, but the exception that proves the rule. Now he has to pick another game. <laughs> now, in regards to these out-of-print games, we did an entire episode about tracking down rare and hard-to-find games where we recommended some places to look you may not be aware of. If there's a game we mentioned today you can't find, Jump back to that episode, and maybe we can hook you up. All right, well, ep uh, episode 56 of the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Treasure Hunt. Find it on the Tabletop Bellhop blog or wherever you prefer to get your podcast. All right, one final thing before we start. Uh, Ashley didn't specify what they meant by older. Uh, this changes. In the industry, in an industry with over 5,000 games coming out every year, some people consider three years old games a classic i saw that today miniature mart is having a sale on classic games and they did this like old school white washed out sepia newspaper and on it is like the teenage mutant ninja turtle game i'm like come on like that they're not like the old has this is the, the modern new one that was like, like kickstarted two years ago i personally want to go back i want to go way back i'm gonna set our definition of older games here for tonight's episode to be games that came out before the turn of the century so from 1999 back no, this is going to knock out a lot of games I consider true classics. Surprisingly, games that are, are not quite that old, like Puerto Rico, Power Grid, Alhambra, Carcassonne, those all came out after Y2K. Well, on to the game recommendations. We're going to start with the board game. All right, number one, everyone probably knows this one. I'm sure you expected this on the list from the start of the episode, and that is Settlers of Catan, which nowadays is just known as Catan Trade Build Settle. Uh, this was published in 1995, but it didn't really hit here in North America until about the year 2000. Uh, it's still one of the best design games out there. Like, I honestly think it is. It's a combination of resource generation, building things on a map, and trading between players really helped build the Euro game, the German game, the designer game as a genre. The whole ho hobby board gaming hobby, I, it really does owe itself in North America to Catan. We still play Catan. I'll admit, not as much as we played 20 years ago, but it still gets broken out. Now, I have to say, for me personally, while Catan is a classic, and I absolutely respect its place in board game history, I could do without ever playing it again. It's, it's one of those games that comes out every once in a while, and, you know, I'll sit down and play it, but it struggles to really capture my attention anymore in the world of, of games we have, and, and games that have, uh, you know, old even older games from the time um you know again it it did something for the gaming market that is you know unmistakable and and it needs to be recognized and it shouldn't be thrown out i mean it needs to be it needs to be there but yeah it's it's not going to be the first of a, a game i have to pick uh, anytime see I'm, I'm i'm in the other boat even writing this i'm like you know what i need to bring out the easy mode is Catan. Because it's a classic, everyone knows it, it's quick to play, I'm not going to have to teach people to play it, and it's great for new gamers. And I still do enjoy playing Catan. One of these days I'm going to find a counter for Deanna's strategy. I know what Deanna's strategy is, and I know one way to stop it, but I have to find a different strategy that works. Because she seems to have not broken Catan, but she's found a, a particular strategy that if people don't notice it tends to work. And I've been trying to find a counter strategy, which isn't just stop her from doing that. So I still play Catan this this many years later. I still enjoy it. I've, I'll still bring it out to events. 
Up next, I've got El Grande. Uh, this also was published in 1995. 1995 was a, a bumper year, actually, for, for hobby board games. At this point, you can find the 10th anniversary edition, as well as a more recently released big box edition, both surprisingly cheap. I personally own the 10th anniversary edition, and I have said, I've mentioned this game on the podcast many times. I use this as an example anytime I talk about Area Majority. This game still is the most pure Area Majority game I've ever played. Everyone starts with the same hand of cards, and you have to use those cards to move your cubes around the map and make the most points over multiple scoring rounds, all based on who has the most cubes where. Yeah, no, it's it's hard to go wrong when when you're looking at the, the pure uh, mechanic games. Yeah. And these are the games that started it, right? Like, I'm sure that, like, Risk is technically area majority, but, like, as far as I know, this is the first game where you're getting points for coming in second and third based on your, your folk on the map or the, your cubes on the map. That was El Grande. Up next, I've got Ra. This was the game that got me to love auctions and board games. Before playing Raw, if someone said, oh, it's a game with an auction, that sounded so boring to me or so not interesting or frustrating because you never know how much to bid. Uh, where Raw does auctions in a unique way that just clicked. This one was originally released in 1999, so it just kind of slips under the radar, under our, our time limit. It was re-implemented in 2009 as Priests of Raw, which I had got mixed reviews. But then Asmodee, and I think because Priests of Raw got mixed reviews, came back out with a new printing of the original. So this one's back on the market, can be picked up. I saw the original printing. Um, I'll admit it's been a little while since this one's hit my table, but I still dig it. I still like it. The unique auction system where you're given three numbers to bid with instead of having to pick numbers out of your head, combined with the push-your-luck mechanic, which I got to say, there aren't many Euro games where you have a push-your-luck element. That's an interesting mix that I really enjoy. Yeah, I mean, everyone talks about uh, power power grid auctions, yeah. but uh, there were auctions long before that. Uh, and unlike, uh, you know, the, the terrifying auction mechanic of, say, Monopoly, this yes. one works and this is good. This is an auction you shouldn't be terrified of. I totally agree. So that was Raw. All right. Another one from the late 1990s. This is from 1998. That is Samurai. Uh, this is a Rainier Nitzia game. This name's going to come up a lot on this list. This is, um, nope, this is the 1998 version, not the reprint of Akuza or Samurai Swords, the old Avalon Hill game. This is an abstract strategy game, um, math, very math based. Like, what else would you expect from Nizia? It's abstract strategy with math. He pretty much kind of signed his name on that. Uh, set on the Isles of Japan. And what's interesting is based on the number of players, you use a different number of islands, which is really cool. Um, you're putting out a bunch of little tokens out on the board, and it's a hex map, and you're going to play units next to those, and they're in numbers. And then whoever plays the majority of the number tiles gets to take the token off the map. Uh, you can find the original Rio Grande printing out there. If you can find that, that's the one to pick up. This is one, if like, it's a really solid game if you like those mathy Euro games. And the components of the original are just so much better than the late, later printed Fantasy Flight did a copy. And they replaced everything with plastic. And it's just not as cool and tactile. It's not the same. So this is one where I actually do recommend the original version of the game if you can find it. A great abstract game that, that almost everyone I show it to actually really digs. And again, this is Samurai 1998, yes. not the 1996 version, and which is a completely different Samurai. So, yeah, Samurai 1998. Uh, Fantasy Flight Games has the current uh, yeah. uh, version. That is correct. That was Samurai. Next, we have the oldest game on this list tonight. Uh, this is Acquire. Originally released in 1964 uh, by famous game designer Sid Saxon. This is all about business investments and stock manipulation. Now, the killer app in this game is the fact that businesses are represented abstractly by tiles on a grid, and they grow and form across the board. And if two sets of tiles touch, that represents a merger. And then there's a whole economic where your stakeholders get paid out and everything like that. It is really well done. Um, despite what sounds like a ridiculously dry theme, and the fact that games from the 1960s, this is still one of the best economic games ever made. Still worth playing. This is one that should be on your list to try at some point, Sean, just because it's such a classic. 
And like, I was shocked I enjoyed it. Like, I knew there were groups that enjoyed it, and I sat down and I looked at it, and it looks so dry, and the, the components are, are are older, right? Like, you got paper money, and and the business tiles look like um, they remind me of Battleship because they say like H two, H three, H four, but that's where they go on the grid when you place them. It just oh, but it's so good. Like it, it really is. Yeah, no, this is this is absolutely a classic. Um, there may actually even have been a copy of this that I was terrified of in my parents' collection back in the day. Yeah, uh, I would because know they it. they did they did play games like this, but it was one of those. It was it was the games that you know were adults only and and were mm -hmm. sort of kept separately from all the games that yep, yep. you know the general role and moves that the kids played. So again, that's acquire. Yeah, that was by 3M Games. There are more modern versions components a little better than the original but there are I, as far as i know it's still in print by someone uh avalon hill has got a has, or has had a license i don't know if they're the current one yeah i don't know if they still are avalon hill which is hasbro so yeah up next i got lost cities we talked about this one fairly recently uh this is another rainier nitsia classic that just makes the y2k cutout coming out 1999 actually late 1999 i have been in love with this two-player card game since discovering it in the game pile at the coffee exchange downtown, uh, Deanna and I used to actually meet downtown and play it on her lunch break when she worked at the library. So this is going back. Um, just make sure when shopping for this one, this even as much as Samurai, make sure you get the right game because there is Lost Cities, the board game, which you don't want. And there's Lost Cities Rivals, which we've talked about on a recent podcast, which is a four player version. I hate to say it, but you don't want those. You just want the two player card game, the original one. It was originally released by Cosmos. I'm not sure who currently has the rights on that one. Yeah, unfortunately, Lost Cities Rivals uh, kind of fell pretty flat uh, when yeah. we when we got that on the table. But uh, Lost Cities again, and you're your classic. Yeah. Um, you want Lost Cities, the card game, not the board game. Even though it's hard to tell them apart, I apologize. That's the uh, blame Thames and Cosmos for that one. Up next comes my biggest surprise being on this list because. I, of course, came up with a bunch of games in my head, and a whole bunch of them came out in 2002, 2003, 2004, and I'm like, wow, not Power Grid, not this, not that. This game was the opposite, because I would have never put this on the list until going through, and I found a Board Game Geek Top 100 list of pre-1999, and sitting near the top of that list was Pitch Car. I had no clue that this game came out in 1995. Like, I, I just assumed it was a much more modern game. Uh, I was shocked by that. Now, I've mentioned Pitch Car, I don't know how many times on this show. It's pretty much, if I can slip in a dexterity game, I'm going to mention Pitch Car. Uh, it is my second favorite. I'm not going to mention the first one, just because we mentioned that one a little too often, too. Uh, this is Crokino on a racetrack. Yep. No, absolutely. It's it's a fun game, easy to play, easy to learn, always gets people's attention for its look and, it, and its play. Can't go wrong with Pitch Car if you can afford it and you can store it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just the base game doesn't take up too much room. Just one box. But you start picking up the expansions like I did. And, and Pitch Car is so well supported. A new expansion came out last year. Like, it's it's still going. Eagle Griffin owns the rights to that one here in uh, North America. And it's and it, it even has expansions that came out in your time period. Like, it's, yes. it just keeps keeps giving. Yeah, yeah it's a, a fantastic game. Again, that's Pitch Car. Up next, I've got Chinatown. Now, this is one I missed. This is one that originally came out in 1999. I heard amazing things about this game. I almost came really close to paying, you know, one of those 80 to $120 prices for it because I kept hearing that it is so good. You've got to get Chinatown. Your collection's not complete without Chinatown. But it finally got reprinted by Z-Man Games, and I was able to pick up a copy at that time. I paid full price for it, which is saying something for me, and it was well worth the rate. This is like the El Grande of negotiation games. This game is just pure negotiation. Here's a map of Chinatown. You get five businesses. You get 5,000 bucks. You own five properties. Next player's got the exact same thing. What do you do? You're going to negotiate. You're trying to trade businesses. You're trading money. It is so well done. And it's, again, in its purity, the same way that El Grande is. If you like bartering with your friends, you got to check out this game. Now, the problem with it is if you get into this game now, you're going to be like me back in whatever I tried to find it because it is out of print yet again and going for silly prices. Yeah, unfortunately, sometimes uh, the classics need to, you know, just sort of cycle through and everyone gets it. And, and I, I find it happens a lot with these pure mechanic games, right? You've got this pure mechanic and it's it's really interesting, but it gets a little done and then other games will take that mechanic and, and 
integrate it with other game, other mechanics to make a what you know in some people's opinion maybe a, be a better game and people prefer that because of the variety mm -hmm. until they've forgotten about the pure mechanic game and you know eight or ten years later all of a sudden everyone wants to try the pure mechanic and lo and behold here comes chinatown again mm -hmm. ready to uh deliver yeah this is one i do hope comes out again and vassal's lie hope is true for a third run on this one all right up next is bonanza which was published in 1997 I was pretty sure this game was way newer than that, so I looked it up, and I didn't actually start playing myself until 2008. So this one took me a long time to find. In 2008, it was still fresh and new to me. Uh, this is another great trading game, kind of fun at all player counts. Uh, the neat part I found with this one, and Sean pointed it out, and it was what made me first think of it when we played on my birthday, is that you can play Bean casually or take it ridiculously seriously, and both ways of playing are a ton of fun, and I've even seen a group with mixed types playing together, and somehow it worked. Yep. No, absolutely. I think uh, you know, on your on your birthday last year, you yeah. were you were taking it seriously. Oh yeah. You were kicking everyone's butts, and no one else really cared. Um, <laughs> we were having fun. We were sort of pushing the limits of the rules. Um, and I think you probably would have had a little more fun if maybe a couple other people were taking it as seriously yeah. as you were. But. It was, you know, it's just an enjoyable game, no matter how you're, uh, how you're playing it. Again, that's, uh, that's Bonanza. All right, Torres. This is another 1999. I, it's not like I was trying to keep as close to 2000 as possible. Just, man, 1999 was a good year for games. Uh, this was out of print for a ridiculously long time, even longer than Chinatown. Could not find a copy of this. I've got an original printing of it. It's back there. It's from Rio Grande Games. Uh, except for the fact it came in a really stupidly large box for what you get in it. I love this game. This is an abstract building game where you're moving your knights and then building levels of a castle. And there's rules about how high up you can join and how far down you can jump and who owns the towers and stuff like that. It's a fantastic looking game that draws people to the table. Uh, it scores over multiple scoring rounds and has a lot of math for what it is, because your scoring is actually at the width of your tower times the height. Um, really neat game. If you played Santorini, Santorini is like the light version of this, where you just have a little tiny building where you're trying to build up to the top. This is like Santorini for advanced gamers. I love this game. Now, this one has a new printing that just came out. I don't know if it's 2019, 2018, but I'm just starting to see it in sales. Uh, that has... Looks a little better. It's a smaller box, and it replaced the boring pawns because this is an old enough game that you know meeple were were weren't invented yet. There was no Carcassonne. They're, they had pawns, wooden pawns that looked like pawns. And now the new version, they're like they look like little knights that are carved. They they remind me of uh, the Viking chess pieces. And I'm like, oh, that looks so much cooler. Except I already own Torres. I don't really want to rebuy it just for cool looking knights. But this is one that I think is worth picking up. You don't need to find the old version. Just pick up the new. So uh, the newest version I can find is actually the 2017 reprint. Oh, it's older than I thought. Yeah. Okay. So that was uh, that's the uh, published by IDW Games, the English fourth edition, 2017. Okay. Fourth edition. Wow. Yeah. So maybe there were three editions in between. I don't know what edition mine is. So that is Torres. And uh, also, I was noticing Chinatown had a 2019 print. Is it already out of print? Like uh, done? Even though but you know what? Maybe when I was looking for it, it was early 2019. Uh, okay. I'd have to look. I, is there, so maybe this one's out. Maybe it's out there. Maybe so it China, Chinatown did have a 2019 edition that came okay. out. See, I'm trying to remember if when I saw it was... No, because I didn't get my copy in 2019. I got mine in 2017. So, right. yeah, so it has come out. So there you go. Vassal's Law. All right. Well, that what it's Chinatown, but also that last game was Torres. Yes. All right. Up next is a classic I know Sean's going to recognize. Uh, that is Space Hulk. I still remember the day I got White Dwarf number 113 back in 1989, which introduced the world to Space Hulk and Terminator Space Marines and Gene Steelers, the new threat to the Imperium. I got the game pretty much immediately thereafter. Um, we took a trip up to Toronto where there was a Games Workshop store just to get it. Uh, this is still, in my opinion, one of the best two-player Amerithrash style games out there. Like, even Deanna, who is a hardcore Euro fan, loves Space Hulk. Every random D6 rolling, p aliens popping out of the corners gameplay, one of the most thematic games out there. 
every five to ten years or so, Games Workshop will put out some deluxe printing with new minis and glossy boards and all that. I, I did buy one of those. It's behind you back there. It was the first time they reprinted it. They're pretty, but I still love my originals 80s edition, especially with all the expansions and stuff that are out there. Yeah, no, my, uh, Space Hulk is is amazing. I still remember uh, the look of Gene Steelers when they came out because it was different enough than the Giger alien concept yeah. to with that insectoid uh, feel that just kind of had its own level of terrifying, different mm -hmm. different than the the uh, the Giger version of uh, an alien. So that was Space Hulk. All right, sticking with Games Workshop, how about Hero Quest? This is the other one that I assume everyone listening, everyone watching from home, however you're seeing it right now, expected to be on this list. This is one of the most famous games published in a partnership between Games Workshop and Milton Bradley. And due to that partnership and the fact those companies, Milton Bradley being gone, we'll never see this one reprinted again. Uh, people have tried and tried and tried. Uh, this hit markets worldwide in 1990. And at this point is one of the most sought after board games for many gamers. I, I gotta admit, I got it back when it was new. Uh, I was into Warhammer already, so a Warhammer board game that looked, uh, you know, wasn't Games Workshop looked awesome. Um, little inside scoop: when Deanna and I were dating, one of the things we did together on dates was played through the original Hero Quest campaign. I'm always gonna have fond memories of this game, both for that reason and the fact that I just loved it before then. Uh, what I really should do is get my copy out, play with my girls. They haven't had to experience that one yet. Of course, I'm going to have to steal the scenery back because I've been using it for Gloomhaven. Uh, and this is one of those games where even though we may never get the real edition out again, um, those who do have it are, you know, suffer from a wealth of content because oh, yeah. so many supplements came out for this. And, you know, so many different magazines printed content for HeroQuest and just so much came out for it. But uh, if you do manage to lay your hands on a copy, there's a lot out there beyond what comes in the box. And that was Hero Quest. All right, up next, Primordial Soup. I have to thank uh, my friend Jamie for introducing me to this game. Uh, it's a, his favorite game of all time. Now, I didn't realize, this is another one that, until looking at uh, that list I mentioned earlier, that this is from 1997. I didn't think it was quite that old. So it does kind of explain the component quality. Uh, this is a fascinating game where you play a bunch of amoeboid organisms floating around the primordial soup, and you go around and feed on the poop of the other players, amoeboids. And as you feed on the poop, you improve your genes and slowly evolve your species. And you're trying to increase your population and your gene sophistication. Uh, it's a fascinating game with, I got to say, one of the most unique themes out there, even to this day, that I still greatly enjoy. Now, this one is long out of print, so I've been able to find copies of the base game. What I can't seem to find anywhere for a reasonable price is the expansion that was released. They only put out one, I think it's called Freshly Spliced, Spice. and I can't find that anywhere for non-ridiculous prices. Like, I'm going to have to trade a copy of Hero Quest to get it. <laughs> Yeah, so the year after, in 1998, they came out with Freshly Spiced, uh, the expansion. Um, and now, interestingly, the original game did have a reprint in 2004. Okay. Uh, and then the Primordial Soup had a reprint in 2007, both by Zedman Games. Okay, yeah, the version I have, I think, actually is being remade, so right. for Zedman. But since then, that's still, that's been 13 yeah, yeah. years now. It's still, so. it's still quite a while ago, even that's before still that. quite a while ago since that one's been back. And that was Primordial Soup. All right, we talked about Settlers of Catan, but who had the game with the plastic ships that you shook and flipped over to had little beads fall out to tell you how far you moved? And that was Starfarers of Catan. Uh, this was a huge grail game for a number of people for a very long time. Uh, this is another one, 1999. 1999 seems to be the year that hobby board gaming like just blossomed. It's been long out of print, only to see a fresh new release last year. 1990, they came out with a new copy of this. And I need to see it, I wanna see it. I, I, I have the original, um, it came out in 99. Um, I have the five to six player expansion for the original as well. Um, it is so much more than just Catan in space. 
And if you want Catan in space, you can get that, that Star Trek Catan, where you use the same map and you have the Star Trek crew. This is completely different. You are upgrading a ship. There's a pick up and deliver element. You meet alien species to get special powers. Um, and then there's even a story element where if, when you fly through space, the person next to you grabs a card off a deck and gives you options. Very cool game. Uh, it's been my preferred way to play Catan for many, many years. Yeah, no, and uh, the, while the ships are not exactly the same, they are very, very similar. The pieces yeah. go on, all the, you know, the roll them over. Um, it's, it's, they've, they've stuck to it very well. The biggest thing is they've rebranded it. It's now Catan Starfarer oh. rather than <laughs> the Starfarer's Catan because they've rebranded the entire Catan series. Yeah. In that same manner, it's where it's Catan first, and then you know, pulling whatever else you you want to stack on the end. Which I always thought was weird because we never used to call it Catan. Well, it must work because now I do. <laughs> but back in the day, it was always Settlers. You want right. to play Settlers? You want yep. to get together, and play some Settlers? We can play some Settlers. We want to play some Starfarers, and that's how we talked about it. Well, it must have worked. The, the rebranding must have worked because I just realized this whole episode, I, I, except for mentioning that it was called Settlers. Yeah. The one problem is if you can find the classic edition. You, if you can find one in mint shape, like it'd be worth a fortune because those ships were made of a very fragile plastic and they break and every copy printed everywhere breaks. Eventually they offered these plastic rings you could put over top of the broken ships so they could at least hold the engines. Uh, so if you can find a copy without broken ships, good on you. Mine are all broken. Every ship is broken. That was a known problem with the game back in the day. I even ordered replacement ships and the replacement ships showed up, and they broke. Like, I don't know what the plastic they used. You had to notch in these little engines, and the clips broke off. Like, I, I don't have every clip on every ship isn't broken, right. but I don't have a single ship that is 100% complete. So in this case, you probably just want to seek out the new copy anyway. There you go. That was Starfarers of Catan, or in the modern age, Catan Starfarers. <laughs> All right, up next, uh, Richard Garfield game. The Great Del Moody, this came out in 1995, two years after he released a slightly more popular card game, Magic the Gathering. Now, from my understanding, he actually designed Del Moody first, but couldn't get anyone to publish it. But then he got famous for putting out Magic, and he went, well, you let me put out Magic, how about I put out this card game? Uh, this is a ladder-based card game, which that's where you have to beat the last person's play of cards. It's basically a gamer's version of President, Vice President, or that other name for that game that I'm not going to say on the show because we're family friendly. Uh, the neat bit here, though, is there are way more cards. You get 80 cards, and the neat thing is you have 12 12s, 11 11s, 10 10s, 9 9s, all the way down to 1 1, which is the great Del Moody card. There's some really fun mechanics here with the greater peon, the lesser peon, the lesser Del Moody, and trading cards. This is a fantastic large group, like up to eight player. Uh, trick-taking ladder card game. This is one my family loves, like the the extended family. My aunts and uncles play this one for, with us. Now, uh, does the uh, Dilbert corporate shuffle stack up the same? It, it, it's apparently a re-implementation. The rules are identical. They just renamed the position. It's probably boss or president and vice president. And right. who, I don't know, probably kept pee on and lesser pee on. CEO sure. and secretary instead of, or something. Yeah, uh, something like that. I'm, I, from what I understand, it's a direct repeat. Oh, that's good. So you admit that, that even that one's 1997. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's still way, still way back there. Now, Great Del Moody is still in print as far as I know. Uh, you could get it at least a couple years ago. It, oh. it just, it's always the coast. It's Hasbro, right? Like they, they, some of their classic games, they can just keep putting them out. <laughs> that's true. Uh, it looks like the last Del Moody edition I see uh, 2016, but it also keep, that's just a different version. Uh, yeah. I still keep putting them out anyway. As far as I understand, that one's still out there. And that was The Great Del Moody. All right, Corridor. This is a mass market abstract strategy game uh, that you used to be able to find in stores that sold puzzles, uh, pool tables, darts, stuff like that. Or stores that sold desktop toys. Uh, the local stores that had it were Duffer and Game Room, and then the um, rather inappropriately named the Man Store at the mall from back in the day, uh, where they sold to uh, mostly office furniture and desk trinkets, like you know, desk golf and stuff like that. Uh, this was released in 1997 and is a fantastic looking wooden abstract game. Just one of those games you leave out on your coffee table kind of like having a chess set out, right? And then when people come over, you teach them to play. 
It's a really simple game where the only goal is to get your pawn from one side of the board to the opposite side, but there's all these walls that can be put in the way. And each turn, you either move your pawn one space or you move a wall, and that's pretty much it. It's dead simple to learn, but surprisingly deep in actual play experience. So uh, there's also a Corridor Kid that came out yep. uh, a few years later. It's a, that broke the one thing. It's the same thing, but it's a uh, I think it's a smaller board and it's a much more bright and colorful version of the uh, yep. of the game. No, yeah, not, your, not your executive path. version. <laughs> yes, the executive version of Corridor. All right, All right. that was that was Corridor. It was a Q. Yeah, Q U so O R I D O R. As far as I know, you can still get copies of that. It's 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 mass market games tend to be around. If you can't find Corridor, you'll be able to find a knockoff. That's definitely true of that one, which is somewhat unfortunate for the original designers, but it's one of those games where you can just find anywhere. All right, I have got one more. It's a longer list than it felt like it was when I was writing it, and that is Battletech. Uh, we're going to make Red Meeple Ryan here happy, and I didn't even plan for this. Uh, this is a classic hobby game from the 80s. Uh, 1985 to be exact, the, the original game was called Battle Droids and might have came out before that. But I'm thinking about my copy of Battletech. I still have it. It's back there. Uh, this is before the days of miniatures and plastic and everything. Mine has cardboard standees for your mechs. Um, well, the game has changed hands multiple times. It's no longer fast. It's gone to other companies. There have been multiple editions released over the years. Like uh, We were trying to look this up the other day. And it was something like 11 different editions of Battletech have been released. What's really surprising is that the current rules, which are put out by Catalyst Game Lab, uh, are like surprisingly similar to the original. Like they have changed almost not at all. The, the core system that FASA created, whoever the designer was of that, and it's bad on me to not know the actual designer of Battletech, it's probably a team, hasn't really changed in 25 years, which that alone is a really good sign. Now, it's a war game that's going to take you a long time to play, and it's it's a game of points and building mechs and tracking little balls and filling in. Like it, It's a very different kind of game than most modern war games. But you know what? I don't do it often, but once, twice a year, I would love to get down and sit and play some Battletech. Yeah, so the uh, original design team is Jordan Weissman, uh, L.R. Butch Leeper, and Forrest Brown. And Weissman, I've definitely heard that name before. I don't know if the other ones are still around. Yeah. So that was uh, Battletech. Yeah, Battletech's such a big license, you can still get it on Steam and play it that way nowadays. Like, it, it's definitely a thing. All right, I've got one honorable mention for this list, and that is Dune, the board game. Now, this is an honorable mention because I haven't actually played this game to know if it lives up to the hype. But my God, is there a lot of hype for this game. It was released by Avalon Hill in 1979 and is considered by many hardcore gamers to be the be-all, end-all of asymmetric games, the, the best board game ever produced for five players and so on. Uh, this game basically reached legendary status among gamers. It's like finding that copy of Hero Quest. No, it's, it's bigger than that, right? It's been out of print, was out of print for like 40 years. It's just gone. You could not find this game. Everyone talked about it. Everyone told stories about their friend who had a copy or they knew someone or they talked about their epic games back in someone's basement, right? Well, that all changed literally this week because Gale Force Nines reprint of Dune should have showed up at your FLGS either yesterday or today. Both our local copy, both our local stores got in their copies this week. You can now go out, go to your local store, go online, pick up a copy of Dune and find out if it's all that. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, the new version is notably higher rated than the old ah. version, uh, and I, I, I don't. I honestly don't believe it. I'm, I'm sure it's a great game. I, I really, uh. I would like to get it, uh, get it on the table and play it. I think it's, it's got some interesting ideas and the way it's done, asymmetry, uh, mm -hmm. and it really is supposed to be a good game. But there seem to be a whole lot of people who are. Uh, you know, doing the, the upvoting thing and, you know, I spent money on it, so it's got to be a great problem that uh, is, is common right now. So uh, right now, with over a 1,000 ratings, it's over 8.3, which wow. is a full point higher than the original. Maybe so, it's 
Maybe it's that good. Uh, it it I might don't know. be. Like I said but, it, it reached that it reached the legendary status, right? Like it, it exactly. was a god of games. It yeah. was it was an icon in the gaming industry. So and I have I have a feeling that a lot of people are rating it high because they finally got their Grail game. I got a copy of Dune, <laughs> right? Yep. So uh, that was Dune as an honorable mention. Now for me, yeah, I haven't played it. Couldn't tell you. For me, I don't really have too many classics that hold up to that harsh light of day. You know, there's a few games out there where it's like, oh, I remember that fondly. And then it comes out and you think, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I was young and, and that game wasn't as good as I thought it was. Mm -hmm. uh, most of my older games were uh, 60, from the 60s and 70s. And again, they were the kids games. My parents had some of the games like the choir that they played, but uh, the kids never even really saw those. Those were off on a different shelf. Uh, and so we played a bunch of roll and move family games, which were fun at the time, but really can't compare to a modern hobby game or even a 20 year old hobby game, as it turns <laughs> out. Um, for me, though, for really, you know, back in 1993, there was Magic the Gathering uh, and I dove in headfirst and spent far too much money on that game. Uh, and I just recently sort of delved back into it, dipping my toe in by getting the Arena app, which is available free. Um, and what it did is it rec recalled some of the thrill I got of playing Magic and the, the engagement with another player, even though it's, in this case it's digital. Um, but also I find that, <laughs> compare, it has evolved so much in the ensuing you know years that it really wasn't enjoyable. And I'm, I'm playing mm -hmm. it because I do and I, I it's it's a habit, but uh, despite the fact that there are ample ways to spend money on this game, they really want you to spend money. Mm -hmm. They aren't going to get a dime because the way the game has evolved is not enjoyable anymore. Uh, what I would really love to do actually is is find a few people who have old decks like mine from back in the night in the late nineties and play them because. Mm -hmm. All the cards I have now, I'm sure, other than my lands, are legal. Um, so I'd only be able to play against other people who had cards from the late 90s. Um, there is a, a version of play that all the old stuff's still legal. I don't remember what it's called. Yeah, I would a, love, like... A number of, of strange versions yeah. and, and, and... Oh, yeah, that's the other thing with Magic, is I don't know. They're, they're like, we're playing Champion, we're playing Two-Headed Giant, we're playing... I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. I have no idea. Um... This is something like, man, if, if it only was last year, I'd be like, bring a deck down. But unfortunately, we have sold all our cards. So yeah, yeah. I'm like, I, that was the thing I, I, I would love to do is just like grab a deck that I built who knows how many years ago and sit down and play. Yeah, I had the same experience. I tried to get back into Magic. I still have friends who play. Tom Barker who still plays. Uh, Mike Murphy plays tournament level. And Steve Singleton had quit and is back into it. So those are like three of the people who are part of my regular Monday night group that are definitely still involved oh, yeah. no, in mean, the magic scene. There's so. a lot of people who love it. And and I, I don't fault the game at all. And I mean, they're doing something right They're You know, magic tournaments are a, a huge moneymaker and yeah. part of what is keeping the FLGS alive. And, well, yeah. and we want FLGS yeah. in our community. So for that, more power to magic. But for me personally, uh, the idea where I could sit down and, and craft a deck out of you know however many cards I happen to have, and that would stand a chance against someone else's crafted deck, even yeah. though I didn't have all the cards. Whereas right now there are card combinations and things that are just ridiculous, and if you don't happen to know it and have that card combination, odds are good that you're gonna get smoked. I've seen some utterly ridiculous things happen in these games. Uh, with with card combos that people have pulled out and it's like well okay it was fun while i was playing but uh you just took 47 moves played 62 cards and i'm at negative 106 down wow it's yeah. that's just not fun so and again i i'm just literally playing build it playing it the way i used to right i've i'm like oh i want to make a vampire deck so i build a vampire deck and i play it um and that just doesn't work as well anymore so that's fine Still a solid game, though. So yep. I'd still recommend. Like, like you want to talk about classic that has stood the test of time. Yeah. Like Magic: The Gathering, '93 till now. Yeah. yeah. I uh, possibly even more popular now than it was then. Yep. That's why it felt like everyone was playing it. Like I just had to go to the local game stores on Friday night, and we didn't have crowds yep. like that. Oh no, absolutely. The university. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, and it was it was still. I mean, when we were involved, it was still a very new game. <laughs> yeah, it was. We got we, in. We got in at floor. the very start of revised. Yeah. So, unlimited had just come out or just ended. And revised was literally brand new the weekend we bought our first decks. Yeah. So, and so that was uh, Magic: The Gathering. <laughs> if you couldn't tell, uh, the next one I've never actually played physically, but I can't stop playing it on Board Game Arena, and that's the 1980 classic. Can't stop. Nice. It's a simple dice-based push your luck game that is implemented, you know, it's simple enough, but it can be great fun when you got a bunch of people who are just all into it. It's been implemented and re-implemented numerous times. It has 22 different uh -huh. editions. But if you've got some dice and paper, that's all you really need. Uh if you look on Board Game Arena, or that's right, on Board Game uh Geek, you can see a huge selection of fantastic do it yourself and homemade yep. boards for this game that are almost inspiring into you know the level of mm -hmm. love people have for this game can. Um I've I've played well over a hundred games now in just since we've been playing BGA. Yep. That's another that's another Sid Sacks. Yep. So that's a like I said, classic designer from the sixties and seventies. Yep, absolutely. Uh that was can't stop. So next we delve into RPGs. All right, I'm not going to go into nearly as many as I went to board games, but I wanted to cover all types of tabletop with this, and I just have huge nostalgia for some classic role-playing games. So I wanted to bring them up, so this is me being a little more self-serving here. Um, the one good thing about RPGs, I think I mentioned this later, don't I? You know what, I'll get into it later. All right, I forget my own show notes. So I'm going to start off, my number one uh, one. And this is 100% me, the one I most want to seek out and I think is worth seeking out. And that is Ghostbusters 2 International. Unlike most RPG gamers, I didn't start with D&D. Instead, my first RPG was Marvel Super Heroes from TSR. Now, I still love that game, and that's cool. It's okay. It kind of stood the test of time. But the game I want most is a copy of... Uh, Ghostbusters 2 International. This was released in 1989, and this was the second RPG I ever got to play. And it's one that I just never owned. I never had it myself. Uh, it was put out by West End Games, and it featured a light version and twisted, somewhat twisted version of their D6 system. Now, the reason I'm looking for Ghostbusters 2 and not Ghostbusters is after doing some research, it comes with more stuff, more cards, it's got some more sheets, and it's got like a Ghostbuster pledge and all this cool stuff. They slightly tweak the rules, and it's generally regarded to be a slightly better game than the original. So if I had to get one or the other, I'd rather have Ghostbusters 2 than the original game. That was Ghostbusters International, the RPG or Next is Paranoia 2nd Edition. Now, while Paranoia is still going strong, and I recently did an actual play of a video game version, what's out now is a very different game from when I first explored Alpha Complex as a team. Nowadays, the commies are gone completely. You don't mention them. And the system's card-driven, D6-based, where you need a card of hands to do actions. I don't know. I always had a soft spot for the original D20 system. Uh, to be honest, the first RPG I ever wrote myself stole the system from Paranoia because I was really frustrated because Paranoia told you to ignore the rules. And I'm like, but they're actually really good rules. So I decided to write a game based on them. And I'm, I'm sorry, they're always going to be commie mutant traders come to me, even if I run the new edition. We're, 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 we're not commie friendly here in my household. I'm sorry if that's not politically correct, but my paranoia has got to have commies in it. Of all the editions of paranoia, uh, they're still coming out. I prefer second edition, originally published in 1987. West End Games, that's the one to me that is the most true, the nostalgia. That's what I want to play. Yeah, no, it's it's hard to go wrong with it. And it really was part of the joke where they actually had a really strong system and rules system in place in this game that they told you to ignore. Uh, yeah. And th they knew it. I mean, they were, it was it was yeah. definitely part of the joke that uh, here have this awesome game that we don't want you to play. Yep. Yeah. Because then you'd become. Exactly. Uh, and that was Paranoia Second Edition way back in 1987. All right, here's one I know Sean's going to agree with completely, Deanna probably as well, and that's Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, first edition from Games Workshop, later Hogshead Publishing, but the Games Workshop edition, Hogshead's the same, same book. 
I am a huge Warhammer fan. I have been since finding issue 100 of this magazine here, White Dwarf. Uh, that's how I discovered it. Um, then went on to a trip to Toronto, went to my first Games Workshop store, picked up Warhammer Fantasy Battle, the hardcover rule book. Dove into, oh my god, I love Warhammer Orcs. I've been a Warhammer Orc fan since that book, Warg. I uh, played a ton of Games Workshop games over the years. Still pick up almost anything that has the Games Workshop name on it. But Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is the one that I keep coming back to. Despite the fact that I tell you I love Space Hulk, I can't tell you the last time I played Space Hulk. Warhammer, though, oh, I love those books. Now, I ran a great campaign of Warhammer 3rd Edition. I tried Warhammer 2nd Edition. I was not a big fan of that one. Of all the versions I played, I still have a warm spot in my heart for the original 1st Edition Warhammer. Something to do with the black humor in that game that they just never captured in the later editions. Now, there is a 4th Edition out there. Uh, I think it's Cubicle 7 puts that out. I haven't had a chance to check that out yet. So... I don't know. I, I just can't see it beating the original for me, but you never know. Maybe it's worth checking out. All right. Huge love for Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I mean, it's one of those games where it's, it's my D&D &D because it was that fantasy uh, immersion that I got into first uh, rather than D&D &D, as, as many people did. Uh, it's that not, it's not low fantasy, but it's lower fantasy. Uh, the magic system was there, but the, they never really printed the magic book and it, it showed up eventually out of uh, the ether later. Um, and so it was a grittier sort of uh, thing. And the fact that chaos was encroaching, you weren't going to live long, happy lives. There was no giant palace with millions of retainers and a happy life at the end. You were going to die. Um, and so what you were trying to do was really just get in there and make the most of your life while you could. Uh, yep. you, you weren't going to, uh, you know, retire on your laurels at the end. And, and that had a, a real solid feeling for me. Yeah, I, that, that's part of what I love about Warhammer 2. It's all about surviving the day, yep. win the battle, not the war. But I always like that aspect. And the, and the small band fighting against impossible odds, right? Being a Star Wars fan, that always <laughs> appealed to me, right? And that's yep. something I didn't realize until I was older was a big part of Warhammer. It, it's, it's very much the evil empire, and, and both empires being evil in a way. Uh, plus, I always liked the politics of it. Warhammer was a very political, city-based game. It was yep. very power behind the throne and corruption, which was very different than Delving Dungeons. Literally power behind the throne in one case. Yes, <laughs> yes. But that was uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, first edition. All right, up next, we do have some Dungeons & Dragons. I couldn't put it, not have it on the list. I'm going to frustrate a bunch of OSR people here, probably frustrate some other people. Uh, this is the one I'll probably get the most flack for, because my favorite edition of D&D &D is a D&D &D second edition using skills and powers and all that goes with it, the player's option books. Um, I've People who dig older D&D &D don't look kindly on second edition much, but this is the game that got me into D&D. &D. It wasn't my first D&D &D experience. My first was, oh, D&D, &D, and it was horrible, which is part of why I didn't come back to it until second edition. But what got me in second edition was the setting material. And yes, I realize it's what kind of killed TSR was the glut of it, but just there was so much out there and there was so much great stuff, stuff like Dark Sun, Planescape, Al Hadim, and all the amazing worlds with all the artwork and Braum and Baxa in particular really caught me, like Dark Sun being my favorite. And I loved AD&D for that. And then it just started to shine even more for me and my group near the end of its run. And this was, you could see the roots of third edition in it, and those are those player options books with the most important, the biggest one that changed the game the most being skills and powers. Now, I know most D&D &D fans hate these books. They scorn them, but they also didn't like using encumbrance rules and weapon speeds, and I love that stuff too. So I, I personally love skills and powers. I love the options presented and the flexibility of that. It was like having all the little brown books in one, and you could build anything you wanted out of them. And to me, that just that was the icing on the cake for D&D &D in that time period. Yeah, it was it was a nice move to get rid of the brown books. Uh, as yeah. much as the brown books had some fantastic content in them, the fact that, you know, to play all the characters you might want to play over here, you had to buy these stack yes. of little brown books that weren't cheap, but, you know, at the time, um, you know, it was an investment if you wanted to get more than one of them, basically. Uh, and so to be able to do that within skills and power without the uh, without all those little books was fantastic. 
By the way, I love the brown books, and no, I think no, we had all of them by the end of it. They were good, <laughs> but it was nice to have one book yeah. that let you do all of that. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So that was AD and D Second Edition with skills and powers. Really, to yeah. piss people and off, and I'm sure I hear <laughs> people booing in the distance. But hey, I love Fourth Edition too, and I get way more flack for that one for some reason. All right, my final RPG goes to a very specific box set, actually. Uh, while I do love the game system and that, but this box set is the Star Wars Introductory Adventure Game. Uh, this was released by West End Games for their Star Wars D6 role-playing system, and and this was one of the most fun RPG box sets I've ever had the pleasure to run. They did a fantastic job of telling a Star Wars story without having to use any of the main characters or any of the main actual plots. It was very well done, and that rules light version of D6 that just did a great job of capturing that cinematic feel of Star Wars. Now, the West End game Star Wars system also gets credit because that system kept Star Wars going when the movie stopped. A ton of what was written for West End game Star Wars became official Star Wars canon and became part of the mythology and the lore and spawned books and comics and everything else going. It is literally credited for keeping that license alive between the period of when the movies came out and when George Lucas decided to return to the director's chair, where things kind of went a little pear-shaped, we'll just say. Now, of course, nowadays, most of that history has been scrubbed clean by Disney and thrown out, and I don't even know what they, the, the I don't know, the old lore expanded, whatever. But you know what? There is some amazing stuff to be found in those books there. Uh, well worth reading, even if you don't ever plan on playing the RPG, just like picking up those old source books from West End Games. Just fascinating stuff to read. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's so much out there. Uh, it's amazing what uh, what got done. And, and you know, it, uh, there's a tear in my eye for uh, what has happened since. <laughs> but uh, you can't, can't uh, stop the corporate machine sometimes. I just, they could have incorporated that stuff. That's what, it was just the, the scrubbing. That, that, that immediately gave me a bad taste for everything new that came out afterwards. And that was Star Wars from West End Games, but specifically the introductory adventure game. I really recommend, like, if you can find a copy of that, it's, it's not that hard to find. It's not that expensive. Just a really good adventure to throw you into that universe with, like, pre-gen characters and everything. Now, as for games where the older printing is actually better. Remember, that was the second part of the question. We, we finally got to it. I can think of a couple cases where this is true. Now, this is very much an opinion topic. What we may think may be great old games, as exampled by some of our RPG picks, may not match your ideas, and our thoughts are <laughs> almost certainly colored by our experiences and the rose-colored glasses that those may imply from our youth. Yeah, very true. Now, this one, I'll admit, I'm not a fan of. This This one's not for me. So these aren't my rose tinted glasses, but um, local gamer I ran into today, Charles Frank, this is his favorite game. There are a few locals that swear by this, and this is the old Avalon Hill Civilization board game. There's two of them. There's just Civilization, and then later was released Advanced Civilization. Now, these are the games that Sid Meier made Sid Meier's Civilization, right? Like the, the, the video game series everyone knows started from these two Avalon Hill games. These gamers, these local gamers, think that these are the be-all, end-all, beat-out every modern civilization game that's come out since, including the Fantasy Flight Civilization, Through the Ages, which Sean Deanna and I played, Nations, Clash of Cultures. According to them, they're all crap. Play the original Avalon Hill version. Personally, I'm more likely to pop in one of the old computer games, but his fans are rather vocal in their love of that physical series. I've heard Charles uh, opine on it uh, to uh, to no end. Yeah, I'm surprised it didn't come up today while we were at the dentist. Uh, Mega Civilizations is new thing. Now that's modern. That's not old. That someone took the old games and made it play like 12 players or something ridiculous like that. And it takes 13 or so hours to play. And all oh, the people who love it, love it. All right, now here's for one of my own. And this is the original printings of Acquire, the 3M bookcase version of Acquire, published in the 60s and 70s, that included plastic kits, I guess it's probably not the right word, but like upwards stackable, the, the company board was a plastic board with plastic pieces that, that, that slot in. 
most of the modern versions of Acquire have replaced those with uh, like cardboard. And it's the original, that it's that tactile nature of the plastic. Which, really, it's an abstract strategy game, and it probably shouldn't matter, but there's just something about that feel that I, I, I personally find. And you know what? You can usually find copies of Acquire at things like thrift stores. So in that case, you might even have to go to antique stores. I, the, our copy came from an antique store in Hero, and they, they pop up now and then the older Sid Saxon, Saxon games. Yep. Now, here is one I strongly suggest. Personal preference here. I know local gamer Roger would disagree. But anyone who has tried the modern Robo Rally, the one that's out now from Hasbro, Wizards of the Coast, I don't know, or Avalon Hill, I don't know which of the three companies they put the logo on, but it looks like a it looks like a Hasbro game, it looks like a kids game. Uh, if you play this, it's a solid game. It's fun. Go try the original though. Besides having much better components, including metal miniatures and more cards and thicker boards, uh, the gameplay is actually quite a bit different. For one, you don't need to have your own deck. Damage counters actually go on your mecha. Uh, there's all kinds of upgrades. There are a ton of different big box expansions with multiple boards that all have new elements, stuff that you don't find on the new boards. Things like flamethrowers and pushers and plungers and lifts, all stuff that's just not in the modern game. This is a game that I most, and again, another Richard Garfield, going back to, to uh, Magic's Gathering fame. It's, it's one of his earlier games. This is a game I would love to see a modern reprint, but a modern reprint of the original, not the, I don't want to call it crap, but not this new, easily more accessible Robo Rally that's out there now. I still think it has a place. It should be the intro. It should be the intro game, the family edition. Yeah. But I still want my old, almost battle tech level, a little bit more gritty, a little bit more to track, a little bit more going on, and a little more complex. Yeah, I think we've spoken about this a few times on the show, and the new version is great for an introduction to the game. but you know, you can't beat that feel of the older one, even though some people uh, are already disagreeing in the chat room. <laughs> yeah, oh, I love the version. Yeah, I have the version with the metal minis. I have the original, the original, uh, was it the Coast printing, I think? I have it and all the expansions. I have everything you can buy for the original Robo Rally I own. And those are some games that I sought out and paid good money for that were out of print. The Armed and Dangerous expansion in particular was particularly hard to find. I bought a copy off eBay. That was one. That was one of my favorite games uh, before it got beat out by Power Grid. And then later Wallenstein. Both which came out after 2000. All right. When we get into RPGs, right? For older games that are better than new games. There are a lot of people out there that are going to mention their favorite game that they grew up with. There are a lot of older gamers who shun modern games completely. Uh, remember number uh, 74 from a few episodes back? There's one of them. Uh, some of these people love and play the classic games to this day and still play them. Uh, along with this, there's the whole OSR thing. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but it generally stands for old school renaissance, though people have other versions. And this is modern gamers, modern games, modern designers creating and playing games that have that old school feel. Uh, these are games like Dungeon Crawl Classics that I've been talking about recently, and games like Zweehander. Zweehander is a modern update to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay First Edition. Um, what's great about RPGs, though, and this is the thing that really shines when it comes to this particular topic, is almost all of these games are still available. You're going to be able to find a PDF of almost everything, and please find a legal PDF and pay for it. You are going to be able to find them. Plus, you can still get print editions for a lot of these. If you go to Drive Through RPG, you can print the AD and D, uh, no, sorry, the Dungeons and Dragons Rules Compendium, which is considered by the old school gamers to be the gold standard of classic D and D. The whole BECM, Back Me, whatever you want to call it, all in one book. You can get a modern version printed for about twenty bucks. It's amazing. Like almost all of these old RPGs, you can get print. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, despite the fact Games Workshop wouldn't do it, as soon as Critical. Uh, Cubicle 7 got the license, they released all the books in PDF. If you want to try out Warhammer Fantasy First Edition, you can. Yeah. Now, one thing about the older RPGs, even more so than games, is that the content within them may be problematic in some ways that people now find offensive. Pronouns, yeah. sexism, racism were a part of these games, and many modern editions have, for the most part, <laughs> you know, not completely, but have come a long way in trying to fix some of those problematic issues that existed in older versions. You will find, you know, 
the he pronoun used excessively or yeah. the she pronoun used universally for everything or all the different things depending on you know when it was released um and and some of the the racist origins of races mm -hmm. in fantasy games exist now your sensitivity to that may vary um if you can deal with some of that again some of these systems are still really good game systems they just have some writing that in the modern day problematic no very true very true very fair and some of the modern versions of these games have not done enough to correct that problem i will i will i will wink at dcc there we were groaning a bit while going through the character generation rules because a dc10 check which is your standard check in that game is a man's deed hmm. as an example and that's that's not the most to reach us. All right, that's it for tonight from Sean and I. We'll go to the lobby in a minute to see how that's going, see if they've got anything. But if you've got a question for us, something like this, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now that we're done with our thoughts on the main topic, we're heading over to the lobby to see what they think. I didn't see a lot going by, but what classic games did we miss? Was there anything on there? I know I know we must have made Ryan happy talking about Battletech. I wasn't even thinking about the fact that he's such a huge Battletech fan. If Ryan's not talking to me about coffee, he's talking to me about Battletech. Uh, I saw Deluxe Illuminati. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Getting mentioned That's the old Steve Jackson game. Yep, yep. Uh, and uh, they pointed out that Jordan Weissman founded WizKids, which is probably why you recognize Oh, that's why I know the name. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, I know that name. I know I know that name. Yep uh every once in a while we saw some deals in there that people missed out on getting starfarers of Catan for 30 bucks oh at, uh, at a con yeah that's a good one one of the reasons i don't play mine i'm missing one chip and i should do something to replace it but it's one of the reasons my copy doesn't come out because it's one of the starting world chits and it's like oh i'm missing a chit so just i have a note for myself here so from 2000 to 2005 uh, this is, I almost didn't, shouldn't have went this far back, really, when talking about great games that you don't want to miss. And I wanted to include this in here because it's important. Is 2000 to 2005 is when the Euro game renaissance happened, right? It's when Catan caught on, when it got popular, when it started showing up in Games Magazine, and when people started to take notice, right? This is when Mayfair Games and Rio Grande started bringing over all the German game designer games, right? Those five years are insane when I look through Board Game Geek. Like the entire Aaliyah series came out that time. The Aaliyah big box and the small box. Almost all the games I consider classic and still play are from that time period. And I'm like, we could do a whole other episode on slightly newer, but not quite as old games that are hard to find. Like some of my favorite games of all time, including Wallenstein, Power Grid, Princes of Florence, Traders of Genoa, uh, Starship Catan, which is a two-player version that they so need to reprint. That was actually our favorite Catan. Deanna and I would play Star Trek Catan over and over and over again. And it was this two-player only version of Catan that was so good. So many games came out in that window. And I didn't realize it until I was like halfway through doing this post, right? So I'm doing this post and I'm like, I keep thinking of games. I'm like, oh, that, oh, Puerto Rico. Like, come on, that's considered like up to, beside Catan, one of the most well-known. No, uh, San Juan, the inspiration for Race for the Galaxy. They all came out in that window. It's a, it's a crazy time period with so many great games. Yep. Uh, Angie Games is saying we could redo this topic, just the 2000 and 2005 edition. <laughs> and yeah. I'm interested to see what's yet in out of print. What would actually be almost interesting is to do a, uh, a Vassal's Law edition where we look and see what games actually haven't yet come back around. What, what, yeah, what, you know, what is out of print that, that needs to be uh, you know, caught up in, in Vassal's Law? That's a good one. Someone send that as an official question. We'll throw it on the list. Uh, so I noticed Ryan questions. noted that Descent first edition being better than second edition. I know lots of people would disagree with them. That's a fantasy flight game. I can't talk to it. I have first edition. I liked first edition, but it was a pain to set up. It was fiddly as heck, and it took like four hours sometimes to play games. And it was really hard as me to play the keeper, the dungeon master, without being a dungeon master. I have a real hard time playing that role without advocating for the players. 
because I want to tell a good story and I want them to succeed, which is something that takes people years to learn as a dungeon master sometimes. But in that game, you're supposed to be the enemy. You're supposed to be adversarial because it's a board game. Whereas second edition, uh, for one, made it quicker so you can play in less than an hour, made the adventures more balanced, made the uh, role of the keeper a little more random, so it's a little less in your face. But even more than that, they eventually put out an app that turns it into a pure co-op. And those are the reasons I would lean towards second. And I own second. It's in the pile of shame. But that's a big game to get into. Like It's like it's like starting up another... Like You don't have to play with the same players every time. But you kind of want to go through the campaign with the same people. And when I'm already playing Gloomhaven, there's not a lot of chance I'm going to get to sent to read to the table anytime. Yep, absolutely. The the app the app I think was the the the, the major game changing. Uh, yeah, that's aspect. the biggest one. Big killer app, killer app, as it were. <laughs> Weird morning started wants to play more than two games of Descent in a row. See, that's just it. I I haven't even played two, but like you can play two, unlike Descent First Edition. So in defense of one e, I should have mentioned when playing one of the campaign. Yeah, the campaign story maybe better. That's possible. What's that? What was the talk about patching? I missed that. Oh, uh, D, uh, D was was saying that you can just play an old school RPG, uh, like an actual old school RPG. That, but by playing the old school RPG, not you know patching the game and and with the modern with version. Of it. The modern versions do tend to fix it. What I've noticed, especially with the OSR games, is that there were different camps that didn't like certain parts of AD and D or D and D or whatever version, and they each made their own version. So if you want to go rules light, not worry about encumbrance or whatever, there's this game. I don't couldn't tell you which is which. But if you really like the tracking everything in the simulation where you want to track torches and this and this and this, there's that game. And then if you really like the the weird settings, there's this game. And there seemed to be like that breakout where everyone's made their own fix for D&D. So whatever flavor. So if you could figure out which house rules you used to use, you could probably find a modern version that does that probably a little better than the original. Uh, what people do like to point out is that AD&D as written is unplayable which I've never actually read them. I have the books, but they were my dad's. But like people talk about High Gygaxian and how literally if you tried to follow the rules as written, they contradict in so many spots, it's impossible. So a lot of the newer ones cleaned up Gygax's prose right. and turned it into actual rules. And I realized that the biggest push on OSR, and this is the thing that the modern games are trying to recapture, which I do agree with, is the concept of rulings over rules. And it's the fact that there are no rules that for most of the stuff you're going to do the DM is given a set of tools to create rulings on the fly. And that is the biggest change, and that's a pushback against D&D 3.5 and 3.0, where it was the opposite, where it was Monty Cook days, and they were trying to make the game more of a competition, and they're trying to make it more organized play, where everyone would have the exact same experience at the table, no matter who they play it under. Which I think is also a very valid way to play, and something that, that makes sense to strive for. But the two, those two types of play are very much at heads with each other. And that's where you get the main two camps in role-playing. Then on the other hand, you have the people on the forge making modern story games going, why do we need game masters? And everyone should tell the story at once and doing their own thing, which has spawned into the apocalypse worlds and everything else of today. Yeah, no, it's a... Uh, RP- I mean, well, there are entire podcasts dedicated to this yes. sort of thing on RPGs, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I, we, I, we talk about RPGs. I have no problem talking about RPGs, but I think there are other shows that do a better job deep diving stuff. Like Absolutely, this. Uh, it's it's we know it, but it's it's again you need to spend so much time going into the minutia of yeah. the the various camps and things that uh, it's it's tough. Uh, well. I think that's about it for the lobby for now. We'll, uh, we'll we might see, pop in later and see what's happening.